I suppose I'm really the doom merchant. Um, and, and I want to give you a bit of a doom merchant uh, sort of message, but I also want to then turn that into something practical if I can as well. I work with GNS Science in Dunedin. I'm a principal scientist, and my background really comes from uh, beginning climbing with the Otago section way back in the... Uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, and then uh, doing some postdoctoral work up here at Mount Cook. And, and then I went overseas, like many people do, and, and then came back to a job where I was given the task of mapping the Southern Alps. And I kind of fell off the radar with the Alpine Club while I was just basically wandering through the hills for, for all the summers. Um, and I've had pretty much, um, oh, I suppose, 17, 16 years or so of... of, of pretty much working every summer out in the hills. My title is New Zealand Fa Mountains Falling Down, but it could easily be called uh, New Zealand Mountains Growing Old. And I wanted to take you back to my perspective in 1982, which was um, a young 18-year-old going for his first trip up uh, Tasman Glacier and having a look up at these big Artur and thinking of them as massive, solid, blocks of rock like I've never seen anything so big or anything so impressive and my view then was very much um, of how eternal these mountains were and how strong they were and how uh, they would be there forever and it was an interesting perspective I, I don't know how many of you will remember the um, let's see if I can get this to work remember that that block of moraine up by Delabesh and how, how for a number of years I was getting fitter because every time I got to it, it was an hour shorter each time. And, and then all of a sudden the realisation that actually it was moving and, and I was no fitter and it was, I, was, I, was, I was just kidding myself. But it was interesting looking at this picture again the other day to see that that's actually a, a rock avalanche deposit. And, and, and then I've noticed another one. I, 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 there's, there's quite a nice rock avalanche sort of deposit sort of sitting in here that I've never seen before. Um, so, so there were things happening in the landscape, but I was just not seeing them. Um, so I went to university and I studied geology, and all of a sudden I got this concept of plate tectonics and how you actually make mountains. And we had explanations of, of India and the Himalayas and, and collision and, and plate tectonics around the world. And all of a sudden I started to see things in a slightly more dynamic way. And by the time I got to third year, next slide, it, it got kind of slightly more complicated. Um, and, and there'll be tests on this later on, but um, if you really want to pass the test, it's that geophysicists think of mountains like treacle. That um, the viscous forces are what hold the mountains up against gravity, which is pulling them down. And you can model at certain time scales and certain length scales the planet in terms of treacle. Um, to me, that's not particularly satisfying. I mean, it works. You can push the treacle there. You can make a mound, um, and it'll flow down again. And you have to keep pushing it to keep it to stay up. And that's what the geophysicists are sort of trying to say in this wonderful paper from, from 1982. Um, but to me, as a geologist, that wasn't particularly satisfying. And um, I'm not going to try and do this. I, I was going to try and show you a, a sandbox model, which I've, I'll, I'll do for our field trip later on today. But... Um, Treacle doesn't have any frictional behaviour, and it won't stay up if you push it up, um, whereas sand is a wonderful medium, and you can push it and you can create fault lines and folds. This was originally one layer of, of pink sand which has been folded up by pushing into it like a bulldozer, and you pile up the mountains and they, they come down, and you can get these fault lines that develop through here as well. The sand is a wonderful medium for, um, for making models, and, and it works well as a model for the Southern Alps. And, and you can look down on it, and you can build things like the main divide and along the top, and you can get all these catastrophic failures. When you're pushing from below, you get these cascade events of avalanches that come down either side, and you can get folds and faults that develop out the front. And I'd love you to come and play with the sandbox with me later on. I'll show you these. But the point is that you can get these catastrophic behaviours and you can model the Southern Alps beautifully in terms of its stress and strain. And what was incredible, by the time I got to about um, postgraduate studies, was that we could actually start to measure with GPS the 
deformation of the plates. And I've got, got here um, the model which shows you the, the vertical uplift rate as measured by GPS of the Southern Alps. And essentially all that's happening there across from west to east is an elastic build-up where the plate motion is just doing something like that. It's bending and it's growing in the centre of the Alps. And that's what's currently happening. But when you model it all, the way that you understand it is that elastically that's going to go pop on the Alpine fault. So it's locked on the fault at the moment. It's growing and it's going to go pop. And the question is what's it going to look like once it goes pop? So it's growing at about five millimetres a year. And the whole plate motion is decelerating down through the Alps. So here's a picture of the arrows of the sur survey points, essentially, and they're slowing down. It's kind of like a car crash that you're seeing there. The arrows, are the, the velocities of the Pacific plate relative to the Australian plate decrease as that, as that car crash is slowing down. It's like hitting a big pole. Um, but it's crashing and it's building up that elastic energy that then will pop uh, on the Alpine Fault. And there's a map there showing you the, the kind of where the biggest amounts of deformation are, right red, right where we are. So if you were to take New Zealand and give it four million years, then we're going to have a shape change, something like that. And it's not happening slowly. It's happening in lurches and bumps every 300 or so years. And... In the Southern Alps, what's happening is that we've got this conveyor belt of material which is being carried in up against the Alpine Fault, and it then comes up the ramp like a whole series of stairs up an escalator. And as it does, it shoves everything up into the air. And there's a, a, a cartoon here showing you the difference between the, the grey wacky rocks and the schist rocks and the Alpine Fault plate ramp as you're coming in, bringing the, the, from the east coast along and then up forming the mountains. So we've got this conveyor belt of collision and it's pushing up, but it then goes into this westerly atmospheric circulation and it pushes the air up. And so we get this huge gradient in rainfall with the west coast having huge rainstorms and eroding all the, the material off the mountains, dry in the east, wet in the west, because you're pushing the, the, this whole delaminated plate up into the, into the atmosphere, into the west of the atmospheric circulation. And we've got a system essentially like this, where the whole crust has been turned up on end on the Alpine Fault. We have the, the rocks, the grey wackies, and the semi-schists, and the schists, which you would normally go downwards, are getting turned up so that as you go across the Copeland Pass, you're kind of like going a journey into the centre of the earth, down into the deeper rocks which have been exhumed up along the Alpine Fault. And we've got this set up with the rain eroding more out on the west side and on the east side, um, less erosion uh, and less uplift progressively. And there's a whole series of other faults that come off backwards as you bend that plate and turn it up, all these faults through the Mount Cook area. And so we've got this system where we unload it by, by having, we, we've got a whole lot of, of deformation that goes on and collision, it then lifts up and causes the rainfall. The rainfall then erodes the, the, the rocks, which then essentially allows it to uplift, which then causes a rainfall. And so we have this sort of cyclic kind of system. We don't know exactly how this operates over the time scales of, of glaciation and, and deglaciation and the exact time scale, but that's the way that geologists tend to think of, of the Alps. And so you're right in this collision zone, and you're delaminating the plate, and you've got the hugest rates of erosion on the west side, and all sorts of landscape is changing. It's evolving. You're, you're turning it up on end, and you're just shaping it continually with this shaving it off with the westerly atmospheric circulation. So we've got all these landforms, and one of the, the ones that, that, that people will know a lot, certainly around here, are alluvial fans, where material comes down, it gets washed off the mountains, and it gets temporarily stored uh, on these fan systems in the valleys where the energy of the rivers come down, loses energy, and it deposits out these fans. And they're a nightmare. Here's the, the Dart uh, Valley, possibly the most active landslide in New Zealand, uh, sitting just off up, up to the side up here. 
comes down, loses its energy and brings down these debris flows, then the, the flooding that's coming down is, is basically great big channels of, of concrete-like material and they fill in the channels that they, they are flowing through and so they then jump out. And so you get these jumping behaviour where one time the channel will come down here, the next time it'll fill in and it'll slow down and stop and it'll jump out and it'll come down here and then it'll go over here and then it'll go over here. So it moves around. And these landforms often tend to be dormant for a while. There's another fan over here and there's been a landslide here, it sits here. They're all through the landscape. They have these debris flows, they carry boulders and the boulders go through things. They're not water. They've got mass to them and they'll travel it up to 100 kilometres per hour. And they, they pulse and they change and they flip and they, they move around and they, ha they lie dormant in the landscape for a while and then suddenly they come down. And they're damaging and they're not, they're not just floods of water. And they make beautiful soils of stony soils which people like to grow grapes on. Here we are at Mount Cook and we've... Um, experienced debris flows around here and we're basically built on fan landscapes. Here's a fan and, it, and the debris flows that come down. The channels have got energy, they lose their energy and they dump out the sediment. And the type of hazard that you have is really dependent on the balance between what gets brought down versus what gets taken away. And so you can have a range of different types of of hazards. Um, in some cases they can lie dormant in the landscape or they can be very hazardous and in this case you've got to do a lot of engineering works to keep the area safe. In Otago we have this huge um, range of landscapes from relatively dormant fans and old landscapes right through as you get into the mountains more and more so the red colour showing you activi the activity they get more active as you get into the mountains. And we have some problems, and I was very pleased to see that um, the Otago Regional Council have been asking for, for, for some questions around some of these uh, issues in Queenstown area, where some of these gullies come down and we built on these landforms which have been formed from these processes. And the question that they have to answer here is, is, is um, you know, are they still active? Would they be perhaps... Uh, tickled up and, and activated by spraying the trees or, or knocking down the wilding pines? Um, and do we need to do as the Japanese do to, to engineer for, for such an event? Okay, so it, that's fans quickly. Uh, the other thing that we, we see a lot of in, in the Mount Cook area is, is the collapse and lateral spread associated with the changing ice levels. And here's the Bull Hut Road. Everyone will have been up and down and walked up and down and seen the effects of that and, and illustrated beautifully by the collapse of the moraine wall propagating right up and, and in some cases right up into the bedrock. And, and Mueller Hut sitting at the very top of, of a very large active landslide which goes from valley floor to, to crest, slowly creeping, propagating various cracks and, and so forth uh, up in the top. Uh, and that was ultimately the downfall of, of um, Multi Brun Hut. Um, that's what it looked like. And if we quickly flick to the next one, that's kind of what it's, it looks like now. The amount of change within the, the, the time, this was a 2014 um, Google Earth image. So um, there's lateral spreading in slow landslides, but we also have a number of large um, remnant rock avalanches in the geologic record which have occurred. And we can go through and, and look at where they've, they've fallen from. Um, in the bottom of this graph here is the, the slope angles and the population of, of landslides. And then these are the, the slope angles and the populations of rock avalanches. And the point to take from this is that, that rock avalanches tend to occur where the slopes get above 50 degrees. And I'll come back to the fact that 4% of the Mount Cook National Park has been affected by rock avalanches in the last 50 years. So what's a rock avalanche? Well, it's when a rock fall gets a little bit bigger. And here's an example from uh, Beatrice in November 2014. We've all seen rock falls, but uh, notice this one here starting to, to evolve. They develop a fluid-like behaviour when they start to break up. The kinetic energy of them is such that they, they basically ride on a cushion of air and start travelling uh, over much larger distances and carrying a lot more mass. And, and here is that Beatrice one. And you can see 
how much it ran out eventually to, to these guys had been standing somewhere here. But you can see, see the thickness and, and, and the run out of, of these things. And, and that's largely how we actually make most of our tills and our moraines, is, is actually from, from material that's fallen off and then being carried down by the glacier. So there's been a number of events, and 2008 was a particularly busy time. Um, vampire collapsed here, down into the, into the Mueller, and then there were a series of other ones in the, in the head of the, the Franz and Fox Neves. And uh, we had a quite a good look at the vampire one, some quite interesting house-sized boulders that slide along, um, sitting on the, you can see the velocity that they, they've come to rest on. But when we got into that, this one in detail, um, we discovered that actually it wasn't just one landslide, that, that there was a whole history of collapse from vampire, and, and we didn't know anything about it. We, 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 we looked through and, and kind of pieced it together um, and found that there'd been a whole series of collapses um, that, that happened in 2008, but there'd been earlier ones as well, and there's been a whole series that come down into the, into the Mueller. Typically, um, big blocks falling off, 70 metres wide, 100 metres high, that sort of thing, bringing down about 100,000 cubic metres, but making quite a big mess on the way. And then also often leaving behind pillars of, of reasonably unsupported rock uh, ready to come uh, down afterwards. And of course, our Iraqi uh, Hillary Ridge collapsed um, July 2014. Um, steep ground came down, came into the into the neve, up and over the ridge, and then down. Um, and as Lou showed, um, down over the face and basically split around Pudding Rock, covering quite a large area of, of the hooker, as shown by this map, uh, in terms of where the dust went to. The, the dust rose way up on the other side uh, and covered over here, but the main debris kind of stayed down in the valley. So. Rock avalanches in the Mount Cook National Park. You can see the map here of the ones, just main ones in the in the national park that we know of in the last 50 years, and that represents about 4% of the national park. So if you're playing lotto, you're about the same chance, if you go and spend a night in the park, it's about the same chance of, of, of being hit by a rock avalanche or being influenced by a rock avalanche as, as you are of winning lotto. Luckily, that's actually a pretty low number. <laughs> and we can look at it and plot that up against the slopes. And where you've got more than 50 degrees the slope, then, then you've really, that's the loaded gun. You've got, a tr that's, that's the trigger, and the, uh, sorry, that's the loaded gun. Then the question is, what pulls the trigger? And we've looked really hard at this. And the problem that we've got is that we don't have any really good seismographs. Um, or, sorry, we don't. We don't have any really good record of temperatures and seismographs and timing for these events. Most of the time, I only find out about them because somebody rings me up. It's not like I'm monitoring for them. They produce seismic signals. They all create magnitude three type earthquakes. Um, and, but they don't necessarily automatically get detected as rock avalanches by our system. Normally, if magnitude three earthquake is for a Geonet person or anyone living in Christchurch is, is just like a truck going past, you don't worry about it. Um, so we don't always work out that they're, they're events. And it's not until somebody says, hey, have you seen the dust up there or something like that, that we, we get excited. And it's really hard to work out the exact timing of the events. And because we've only got one one weather station, essentially, we, we can't work out always exactly what sort of temperature conditions they've occurred at. I can tell you that a number of them occur after you've had a, a prolonged warm period. Maybe it stayed warm above freezing for three days, and then when you hit that first night of cooling at 4 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, that, that cool spell after that prolonged period, that freezing event is often triggers them. But that's certainly not the explanation for them all. The thing that's really interesting is that if you plot up the numbers, it's exponentially growing. And I've got a list of some of the ones starting from Mount Cook, 1873, and, and, and through here, and, they, and that was up to the 2008, and, and it can go on. But... The cumulative numbers are going up and up and up. And the question is, why? 
Now, before you do get too quick to blame uh, climate change and, and, and permafrost degradation, we've certainly been deglaciating for a long time. Uh, and I was, my immediate response initially with Simon Allen, we, we looked at this and we tried to publish on it. And we could not get it through peer review. And the more we looked at it, we could not justify that it was just climate change or ice withdrawal. And so there's a paper that, that it deals with this, and so I've actually published with climate change in my, uh, on my title. So, uh, but here's another thing to think about. Copeland hot pools. We had an earthquake in Fiordland, and they changed temperature. Here's the temperature decay. It was coming along. They sit at about 58 degrees, lovely temperature, about what your hot water cylinder is at home. And... An earthquake 350 kilometres away in Fiordland caused a little spike and then a decay in temperature. What was going on? Well, when the seismic waves passed through the, south, the, the, the southern Alps, they rattled the rocks, opened the cracks and allowed the rainwater percolate down through more than it had been before. That was like turning the mixer on your shower around to cold and allowing the cold to come through. We're getting influenced from far earthquakes where the same thing happened again in the, the Christchurch earthquake, uh, sorry, in the Darfield earthquake, the magnitude um, 7.1, where the stress that's built up, as I showed you with, the, with this, some of that gets released by passage of seismic waves coming through the, through the Alps. So here's a, a, a model showing you the moment the total energy, essentially, of, the, of New Zealand distal earthquakes. So all the earthquakes all around New Zealand over time. And you find that we have had more earthquakes, and the energy that's been released has been more in recent times. And you can fit that curve. So it's not necessarily just climate change. That we can be doing things hydrologically with, with the, the, the elastic behaviour of those rocks. So the point is... We've had a massive increase in rock avalanches, but they're, they're, they're occurring naturally. And um, the question is, if you hit it with a big earthquake, what's going to happen? Because we're right at criticality at the moment anyway, and we've got the Alpine Fault. And Lou's introduced it nicely for us. It's one of the longest, straightest, fastest moving plate boundary transform faults in the world. 75% of our plate motion occurs on it on the long term frame. It has a rapid slip rate. It turns up the crust and it releases every 330-odd years, um, but it varies a little bit between 260 and 400 years. It has a, a very regular return interval, and we haven't had a major event, oh, my slide's out of date, for 299, nearly 300 years. So this likelihood, 30% chance in the next 50 years of a mag magnitude 8 or so earthquake. What will that do? Well, it'll give the, shape, give the Alps a hell of a rattle and it'll knock a lot of them down. Um, the intensity of the shaking that you feel will, will certainly, through the central zone, is expected to be MM8 or MM9. So that's the, the intensity of it rather than the magnitude of the earthquake. And then further afield, it'll decrease. And that will produce a landscape response. And just looking at the records in the lakes, you can look at these drill cores, and we already have events sitting in the lakes where we have an earthquake event and then the sedimentation, like a tape recorder, telling us about what, what happens. So we have, for example, the, the, the sedimentation from the 1400 earthquake and then 50 years of basically earthquake-driven erosion before you then get undisturbed lake sediments before the next earthquake comes along. So we have a long period of, 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 of change. And when you hit mountains with, with high accelerations, you generate big landslides. And here's just a couple of examples from uh, the Murchison earthquake, 1929, Lake Staveley, 18 million cubic metres. That's, that's bigger than the Mount Cook rock avalanche collapse of 1991. Or this really impressive one. We don't know when it occurred in the Cascade, uh, but it produced 750 million cubic metres of mess in the valley. One of the things I'm not too sure about is that if we do have a big bit of landscape disturbance, 
And we do produce a whole lot of dirt and, and, and free surface all through South Westland. What will the effect of invasive species be? Will that mean that we now colonise all these species of thistles and broom and gorse and things that weren't there when we had that last earthquake before Europeans came? I don't know. It's something that I'm very interested in, and, and if anyone knows about that sort of thing, I'd certainly be keen to talk to them about it. So, we need to think about our huts, or our, our behaviour and our occupation in the National Park. And we, one approach is, it would be really just a red stick of them. Just keep out of the park. It's too dangerous. Alternatively, you can take an approach where you say, well, okay, how do, we, how do we deal with our investment? And although this doesn't look all that good, um, I would say that this was actually a really good example of success, that whoever positioned this hut here was certainly not expecting to see quite the amount of rubble fall off the south ridge of, of Cook. Um, but... In placing that hut there, they did a perfect job in that anyone that had been in there would have survived. Except that they probably would have heard this freight train going past, thought, what the hell is that? Stuck their head out the door and got whacked by a rock as it came through. But this was actually a really good piece of engineering and it's a really good example of how to do things pretty well. We knew there was going to be a rock over lunch somewhere there. We didn't know exactly how frequently it would, it would come, but... Um, when that was placed there, it was a really good site. So you can do things to mitigate where you place things. And it's kind of a bit like you would behave, you know, for example, your geologist wants to go and look at this outcrop. You can choose the places you go, and if you're taking people to those places, you have to make sure that you're not putting them in more hazard than they would go into if they were to randomly walk there without any knowledge. The idea is to make it slightly safer for them by having that structure there or that, that thing it is that you're attracting them to. So you do need to be really on top of your hazards. And it's great to see some really experienced people, Don Bogie and, and other people working for DOC. We need to take all of these things into account. And the key is you have to have a holistic approach to these things. There's a whole series of geological ones. There's a whole series of meteorological ones. And you can't just go and ignore one You've got to look at them all and think through the difference between the, the hazard and the risk. What, what, uh, what could happen and, 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 and then what's going to get in the way um, if it does happen. We can put together the faults in the Mount Cook National Park and we can, we can look at what they might mean in terms of earthquake sources, whether they be the, um, whether they be the Alpine Fault or some of these other back thrusts that occur which are producing the topography over here. We can look at the rock avalanches. We can add those onto it, and we can look at those slopes, and we can say, at more than 50 degrees, let's be very wary. But also the key thing is to think through some of the runouts are really quite impressive where, you know, Mount Cook, when it fell off, Araki came up and, and rose up the other side of, of the multi Brun range. We can add in the lateral spreading and the other landslides. Um, so there and, and perhaps the next one. Here's the, the places, the moraine walls that are likely to, 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 to get affected by, by climate change. Um, and then we can add on top of that um, a layer. Oh, yeah, tsunami, I haven't even mentioned that. Um, of course, when you've got lakes there, things fall into them and, and they can produce some quite nasty effects as well. Um, but looking at shaved bedrock surfaces, they're often a really good spot to be looking as, as, as we've always placed huts. Uh, on these places. But you can build up this hazardscape where you've basically got a holistic view of the whole thing. What we have to be wary of is, is the top version, like it's too hard to deal with it. Um, but the other one that you have to be very careful of is this kind of knee-jerk reaction. You know, Christchurch, the liquefaction was, was very bad, but all of a sudden... Everything, you know, the world is, is revolving around liquefaction. In actual fact, it, it, it may well not be the, the elephant in the room. And it's a bit like, you know, rock avalanches. I could tell you a, a hell of a story about rock avalanches, but the Alpine Fault's just about to go off, and it may well be the worst thing. Um, so you do have to build up this sort of holistic um, sort of picture of the whole thing. I think the approach really is that we have to take – 
a view as we move into these mountains of, of, of doing something completely different. In the past, we've been driven by the building code, and the building code says that you have to build a structure that will last for 50 years. That is not the right approach here. The landscape won't last for 50 years. What you need to do is to be able to build something with your investment so that you can move it if the landscape doesn't last. If the mountains get old and, and they're getting tired all around you, you move to a place where they're, where, where they're less tired or where, they start, where they're less active. So, you know, if we're putting huts in, we need to be able to pick them up and move them and recite them. They've got to be... And that investment, that cost associated in, in your initial investment has to be then worked out over a time frame of perhaps 10 to 20 years rather than over, over a 50-year period. That has implications for, for how you treat the park. If you occupy lots and lots of sites, they're all going to have potential uh, pollution problems with um, just having people in those areas. So do you take people to the same places all the time and impact those areas in a big way, or do you spread that impact out evenly? And, and so those are the sorts of issues you have to work through. So I hope that I have frightened you. Um, I hope that I have made you realise that it's an incredibly active landscape, but it's also an incredibly rewarding landscape, and there are solutions. There's no, no, no issues to finding solutions. We're very, very lucky that we don't live and we don't have the population pressures that are forcing us into these really, really high, um, high activity areas. We, we've got some population pressures, Queenstown, Wanaka, you know, anywhere where you've got topography, you're always going to have problems. But we're lucky that we're not kind of pushing up like in Nepal. And, and as soon as you start to carve a road or you start to do engineering works in these places, you make it even worse. You, the chances of triggering these things are much, much higher. So we are very fortunate that we have national parks, that we have good people looking after them, and that we're sitting here talking about um, how to deal with these issues. So thank you very much.